day four, um, the last day of our conference, which it feels, it's always a, a weird feeling when it's the last day. Um, and, and it went by really fast, but we've been really um, grateful to have all of you join us for so many wonderful discussions. And, and I recognize some people have been on every day, some people who jumped in and out. So I hope that you've taken a lot from this conference um, so far, and we're just here to add more. And I was just sharing a little bit earlier to our two panelists today that um, the main theme that I feel like we've really touched on in the last couple of days has been um, centering Palestinian narrative and voices. Um, and uh, beyond that, not just as victims, but as more than victims, right? And as people who celebrate love and who encompass resilience and beauty and power. And so um, this is the perfect way to continue that and to kind of, um, you know, follow that today, what we have lined up for today is really um, honing in on that and following in, in that kind of ideology of how we want to talk about and learn about and be Palestinian. Um, so we're very excited for um, an amazing panel to start off the day. Um, I'm going to just jump right in and hand it off to one of our awesome moderators, who's also in one of um, PAC's uh, virtual courses and just a PAC community member, Jinan Abu Hekma, the floor is all yours. Thanks, Abir. Good morning, everyone. My name is Janana Bragman, and today I'm presenting uh, with a virtual background with a picture from my last trip to Palestine with PAC, part of the Homeland Project in 2017. Um, I'm so glad to be here with everyone and present our conversation titled The Fine Arts as Symbols of Resistance. Art, music, poetry, and other creative outlets have always been integral parts of resistance movements, and this panel will showcase ways in which creative artists use their talents to turn beauty into power and make a lasting impact for social change and justice. Joining us today are Christian Davis Bailey and Wafa Agneem. Christian Davis Bailey is a writer and cross-pollinator based in Chicago. His work has focused on intersections between the Black and Palestinian struggles and Black internationalism. He is a co-founder of Black for Palestine and a co-author of the 2015 Black for Palestine statement signed by over 1,000 Black activists, including Angela Davis, Cornell West, and Mumia Abu-Jamal. His work has taken him to Detroit, Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan, South Africa, Morocco, and Brazil, Christian is also the communications manager at Palestine Legal. Thanks, Christian, for being with us here today. Wafa Ghanem is a Palestinian American artist, researcher, writer, educator, and businesswoman who began learning Palestinian embroidery from her mother, award winning artist Fariyal Abbasi Ghanem, when she was two years old. Her first book, The Threes and Tea Embroidery and Storytelling in the Palestinian Diaspora documents the traditional patterns passed to her by her mother. Wafa has since become a leading educator in the field as the first ever Palestinian embroidery instructor at the Smithsonian Museum and an artist in residence at the Museum of the Palestinian People in Washington, DC. In addition to her extensive scholarship, Wafa continues her mother's educational legacy through Tatriz and T, a global arts education initiative she began in 2016. Thank you so much, Wafat, for being with us here. Both of our speakers will speak for about 20 minutes each, and then we will have about 20 minutes for question and answer. Please feel free, everyone, to type out your questions throughout the session, and we will get them up, get to them all at the end in the order they were received. And I will pass it off to our first speaker, uh, who I believe is Wafat. That's me. Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for having me. I am going to share my screen. Um, so I wanted to come into this conversation with some answers for you about how resistance emerges through art, um, in particular in Palestinian art. But I guess the it's and and the answer is really through the personal and the political for me. So I'm going to start first with the political. Um, and I think like the first thing that I very much appreciate about even just the title of this panel is that we're regarding textile arts as more than crafts. Normally these, this kind of art form is regarded as a craft. It's a craft and crafts 
and that titling that it's a craft um, has a long history, which I talk about a lot in my classes um, that really sort of like takes it to, it's almost like secondary to an art form, to fine arts. And a lot of my work is bringing the history of Palestinian textile art into the art history world, into the museums in the Western world. And um, so I guess what, how is this a symbol of resistance? I always talk about my personal in the context of the political because who came before me um, influenced uh, the way that we're interpreting Palestinian wow. embroidery and the way we're using Palestinian embroidery um, today. So this is an image that I think many of us are very familiar with. Um, it was taken in the 1990s by Maha Sekka, one of the most you know, regarded individuals in cultural heritage preservation for Palestine. And she took a great interest in um, the 1990s, which if you remember at the end of the first Intifada and the Oslo Accords, uh, there was a lot of um, sort of like Palestinians were so disheartened by their own leadership and by the international community and it started to take hold more on how they wanted to preserve their own art and how they wanted to envision Palestine and Palestine as their homeland. And so Mahaseka emerges in the 1990s to really start reviving this idea of um, the different styles, the regional styles that existed in pal historic Palestine before 1948, specifically between 1850 and 1948. And so these kinds of images kind of emerged and, and it was very radical at the time because she photographed so much. She photographed um, these different styles. She turned them into postcard, postcards, posters circulating the diaspora. And, and this was a very radical move by Mahaseka, something we hadn't seen before that ended up educating the Palestinian diaspora, my generation and other generations. So many of us in the Palestinian diaspora remember growing up and looking at these images. And the, the truth is, is after after 1948, um, there was quite a bit of a blackout period in Palestinian embroidery, Palestinian textile production. Palestinians were no longer able to access their beautiful fabrics, um, their beautiful threads, and they were subjugated to living conditions that didn't allow for them to produce beautiful uh, celebratory dresses any longer. But yet still, how did Palestinian embroidery survive? This is an image actually from a refugee camp in the 1950s, one of the very few images we have during this time period where we see Palestinian embroidery appear and you're seeing styles from all various villages. So how, how did this art form survive? And one way that I like to kind of explain this in the context of like, how did this, because listen, Palestinians, we have done a remarkable job preserving our art forms. We have done a remarkable job per, like preserving our traditional costuming, our textiles, our embroidery, our motifs, and our techniques. How did we do that? Because if you look at other areas, like if you look at Syria, if you look at Lebanon and Jordan, we Palestinians have become very famous. Like it's very amazing how we have against all odds preserved this art form. And actually, I believe that Palestinians produced a really crucial framework um, for preser cultural preservation for all cultures around the world, regardless of whether or not they're under occupation or in war, and that we have provided a very valuable, um, like sort of case study of how textile preservation can survive, can survive these eras of war and occupation and so forth. But I love to start and look at like, what are the ways that we have preserved this? cooperatives, collectives have been going on in historic Palestine. This is in the 1930s under the British mandate, preserving our textile tradition. So this goes beyond just embroidery. We're not talking about weaving. We're talking about spinning, sewing. We have boys learning how to weave and spin their own threads and fabrics. These are very traditional formats. Even after 1948, we have images in the 1960s, 1970s of women coming together um, primarily women post-1948 coming together and doing stitching circles and stitching and doing what they can to kind of keep this art form moving, even though the format of the embroidery changed and the materials and our ability to access our traditional uh, materials changed as well. 
Many images circulate online now that show us embroidering in refugee camps and all across the diaspora. And most remarkably, and I guess the main thing I wanted to focus on in the question of the political is the first intifada. And um, the reason that I wanna focus specifically on this particular event is because after 1948, we have like a couple decades of real blackout period. We don't have a lot of information on how Palestinian embroidery was practiced, what was happening. And then suddenly we see an emergence in the refugee camps where women are like are working through associations such as Inash and others to produce embroidery for sale and to use it as a way to um, supplement their income or as a primary source of income. And and Ash is very innovative, like very contemporary. We see by the 1960s and 70s, we're seeing neon colors, bright color fabrics, just very contemporary iterations. Um, first Intifada, 1987, um, we start to see, first of all, as we all know, the First Intifada emerged due to increased home demolitions, violence against Palestinian children, um, stricter curfews, cruel treatment of civilians by the Israeli military, and the international community turning a blind eye. In this time, um, Palestinian women have to now start taking more of a frontline role in their, uh, in their resistance movement more than ever because their husbands, their brothers, um, their fathers are now detained, martyred, tortured, all of these various elements. And these images are actually remarkable, actually, to see women sitting under a window, embroidering in resistance, in the darkness, under curfew, worried that they are going to be attacked or shot through the window is incredible. This series of images is valuable. We're seeing them taking care of children and doing embroidery. And what emerges from the first Intifada is a series of beautiful dresses that we've never seen before in the history of Palestinian embroidery. We see the flag dresses, the first Intifada dresses. They're the most well-known resistance dresses we have through our Palestinian embroidery. It's the first time we see architecture in our embroidery. It's the first time we see calligraphy in our embroidery. It's the first time we see human forms in our embroidery, rock throwers and various other elements. We see traditional motifs being adapted into nationalistic ones. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because ultimately embroidery is not a likely form of protest. It's not a likely form of resistance art. Embroidery is slow. Embroidery takes special materials. Embroidery takes time. Usually resistance art, protest art is, um, is something done in the darkness of the night. You know what I'm saying? We're talking graffiti, we're talking protest banners, we're talking various types of very incredible art forms, but produced in shorter time periods for the moment at hand, for the, for the movement or for the political protest or whatever the event is. We don't normally see something like this that takes a year to produce, months to produce. Imagine embroidering this in darkness. And imagine embroidering this with tears in your eyes because your husband was just martyred and you're taking care of your children and you're stitching it under a windowsill. This is not a likely form of art. And that's what makes it so incredible. There isn't a real clear origin story on these dresses, um, but we believe that they emerged around the villages of Hebron and the Kalandia uh, refugee camp um, who had become more involved in the protests. And, that, and these dresses, um, you know, here's, here's more flat, we see flags, we see actually, if you look here on the chest panel, we see uh, the, form, the form of the historic, historic Palestine, the borders of historic Palestine being like envisioned right there on the dress. Can you imagine that? Why do you think they did that? Around this time, Palestinians, as I said, were so disheartened by their own leadership and by the international community that they had to start embroidering the borders of Palestine, their homeland, in order to feel that they could envision it. Can you imagine that? And this is where we start to see the emergence of the Palestine map. 
That's where we start to see the emergence of nationalistic motifs in our dresses. And this is truly the inspiration in which many of us Palestinians producing this art form now um, come, come from. This is our origin story as Palestinians in the diaspora. But ultimately, what I wanted to make the point is with embroidery is that embroidery is very time consuming. It's a community oriented art. And these garments embody the essence of the intifada, the essence of resistance, um, which is uh, sabr and samud. It's our steadfastness, our perseverance, and our patience two qualities that are taught in our resistance movement that are also taught and trained to produce this type of embroidery is our own patience to sit and stitch this, our own perseverance despite the difficulty of producing this art form. Um, so with that in mind and um, kind of turning this into a dis more of a discussion, because I know I, um, I don't know how many minutes I have left uh, to talk, but <laughs> I know from the personal and how I kind of bring this into the personal. Actually, how, what is this? Can I do a time check? Do I have like 10, five, 10 minutes left? I think you're good. Gina. Yeah, we're still good on time. <laughs> Um, ten, so like if I have 10 minutes, I'm going to do this one slide because it's important. But um, the legacy of the first and Safada dresses, the legacy of so much of the work that was produced after 1948 are all lessons that we carry in our resistance art today. Um, and actually, I wanted to show this one slide. That's why I was asking before I move on to the question of the personal. How do I resist through my art? Um, so if you look at the thob in time, the thob in the thob is uh, the thob is the Arabic word for anyone who doesn't know in the audience for dress for our, a traditional dress. It could be referred to as a Syrian dress, a Palestinian. You know, thobs are these are all types of thobs, right? Um, the thob in Palestine, in and of itself, the essence of it, and the fact that it even still exists, in and of itself, is the resistance, is the radical element to this work. Um, if you, I, I mean, we are able to look at like the thob and how it appeared in this region in centuries ago. I mean, here's one from the Kadisha Valley mummies of the 13th century. We have pieces in um, museums that are, you know, 19th century, 20th century. We have here on the second row, a uh, mid 20th century dress here on the bottom um, left that was originally produced in Ramallah in the 1920s but, and 30s, but was then sold in the refugee camps or gifted and then adapted in the refugee camps for a woman much taller using Anurwa flower sacks in the, in the torso. So this like improvisational element, we have the first intifada dress here in the middle, another one here that you're seeing. And we also have in the very bottom row on the right hand side, we have the non-regional diaspora dress, which is very still remarkably close to the to the thobe that appears on the mummies in the 13th century. So in essence, in essence of this art form, this is still a, the fact that it's still alive, this fact that we're still practicing it is radical. Um, is a radical statement. Um, in terms of the personal, like as I was saying, I learned palace, I learned embroidery and um, sewing from my mother. And um, she, you know, I'm wearing her, I, I was still wear the thobes that she created and we created together when I was a child. And my mother has in large part, um, when she first immigrated into the United States, she she started teaching Palestinian embroidery and practicing Palestinian embroidery in like a um, public way. Like she was doing demonstrations and folk festivals and things like that and bringing me and my sisters with her to sit with her um, from a very young age. This is me at looking like a deer caught in headlights when I was two, but, um, but I'm there. I was actually doing embroidery. There's images of me doing embroidery at two years old. And in that wheat harvest dress, actually, you see that one, that's the one I'm wearing here on the right. Um, so I grew up with embroidery, not it's sort of, it was, it was like at two years old, you know, I don't know if any of you have a two-year-old, but at that time you're teaching them how to use silverware. You're teaching them how to get a shirt on your head, which is actually really hard to explain. You're teaching them all these survival techniques. And my mother taught me embroidery at this time. So I really don't know life without embroidery. This is me at one of the demonstrations. 
But what I did learn throughout these folk festivals and kind of how I started to view embroidery at this age is that I was an outsider, that, you know, these festivals was predominantly attended by, you know, white America. And when they would come, they would come to touch our hair and to look and touch our embroidery and to ask us questions about our ethnic uh, exoticism like it, it, it was like we were just on view you know and um, I learned at a very young age like what it meant like to be Palestinian in this country and um, you know what I needed to do to kind of self-preserve not just preserve the art form but um, now and I'm just in the last couple of slides just saying like you know I went from really like serving and I still am like an assistant to my mother in her work but now my work primarily focuses on identifying dresses you know I do produce embroidery and I do teach classes to produce embroidery but my greatest interest is in actually properly identifying the dresses the Palestinian dresses that are in western museums that have been sitting in those collections for a hundred years and have not been identified as Palestinian and they're ide wrongly identified or they are just sitting there collecting dust these dresses are in exile much like we are somebody wore these dresses somebody lived day to day wearing these dresses. They were known for these dresses. Their children looked at them wearing those dresses. Now they're remembered by their children for wearing that dress. And now it sits at the Metropolitan Museum of Art without a name, without a face. And Edward Said once said, um, I always remember this quote, that exile is a series of portraits without names. And, and I look at these dresses like portraits. And um, these are portraits of people that need names and I might not always know who wore this dress but I do, I can I can tell quite a bit I can identify the time period the village the materials there is so much I can tell in the story of the dress um, in a factual way and um, this is really my work um, this is my work at the Metropolitan Museum of Art it's in my work at the Museum of the Palestinian People and hopefully as I continue to teach at the Smithsonian and I'm still allowed to teach there because I'm getting to be quite radical in my statements um, so crossing my fingers but um, but you know I'm going to continue to tell this story unapologetically and kind of one final thought you know before I pass on the mic <laughs> is I don't know if any of you have ever gone viral online, but um, it's terrifying. It is a really terrifying experience to go viral. Um, I've had a number of videos reach millions of views and um, it's absolutely one of the most terrifying experiences I've ever had. And I'll tell you why. It's because I receive two, two streams of hate, okay? One stream from Zionists. 100%. They come at you and it's just, it is what it is. It's frightening. It's scary. They're threatening. But then you get a whole other stream from Palestinians. And, and I guess I appreciate, you know, I want to say like very clearly, I receive report, support from the Palestinian community. I love my community. But the most criticism and outcasting that I experience is not with Zionists, it's with my own community. And so I want to stand up and kind of say that I really look forward to the day that we can in our own community practice this idea of solidarity and inclusivity and acceptance and tolerance, much like we want and demand and are fighting for with the rest of the world, we must also find that within our own community and accept that we each have a different connection to our art form. We accept that we have a different connection to our tradition and accept that we each have a different approach and identity as diaspora Palestinians and that that's okay. And then that's what we're gonna bring back when we return to Palestine is all of these different views in the diaspora that are all equally valid. And for us to find that cohesion so we can fight together. Um, thank you. Thank you Wafa so much for those beautiful words and reminders. Um, I'm going to pass it off now to Christian. Okay, um, thank you, Janan, and thank you so much with that. That was really such an amazing presentation. Um, I appreciated learning about the history and um, just happy to join you all today. Um, and uh, with that, you actually got me to change the start of my presentation um, because I want to um, 
start with, let's see. Just one moment. Oh no, okay, you're not gonna get video today, but I will start with audio. So um, uh, this is a picture of uh, the mother of one of my friends in Jordan. We call her Mama Mejda, um, but she um, uh, does embroidery. She makes all these beautiful um, dresses and, and thobes and um, other um, uh, textiles. Um, and she sells them to folks in Jordan and uses the profit to benefit um, women in uh, the refugee camps in, in Jordan. So that's a form of both resistance and solidarity and like moving culture forward. Um, and um, some of you may know the uh, Palestinian artist Suhail Khatib, um, uh, but the, the person I just showed you is uh, the mother of Suhail. Um, so this is a family that's very deep and rich in um, just using art as a form of resistance. Um, so I would like to, uh, one second here. Yeah, so I'll, I'll be talking today about art as resistance. And I wanted to start with this poster uh, by the Sudanese artist and cartoonist uh, Khalid Albay. Um, because this picture to me represents what the, the potential of art is. Um, it might not always stop a bullet, but it is a form of resistance in both targeting and uh, 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 weakening the power of those who oppress us, but also of reaching uh, people across borders, across just the world um, uh, to bring people to our side and our struggles for freedom. Um, and um, I will say that, um, yeah, for me, art is really both about, um, I, I'm a writer, sorry. So um, uh, I've been a freelance journalist. I write a lot of political stuff. Um, and for me, even when it's not necessarily creative writing, um, it, it's still a form of art because it involves like, being intentional about how you arrange narratives, uh, how you craft a story. Uh, but I also see journalism, particularly when it's doing its job, um, as being resistance in the form of speaking truth to power. Um, does journalism always do that? I would say no. Um, but to, um, uh, second. Um, so I, I started out as a journalist for a campus newspaper in college about 10 years ago and um, was really interested in going to journalism kind of as a career. But um, once I started learning about, <clears throat> you know, what was happening in Palestine, um, this was around the time that Trayvon Martin was killed uh, before the Black Lives Matter movement started. Um, and during the time of the Ferguson uprising, um, I really began to see just how limited most of our media is in terms of actually um, talking about systems of oppression or injustice. Um, and so for me, just looking at this Malcolm X quote, um, I realized that a lot of the times media uh, inverts the situation. So it has us hating the people who are being oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing. Um, and so um, through the, seeing all of these different social movements, it kind of pushed me into a different form of writing, um, which was a lot more like direct and po directly political. Um, and the main way that this came out was in um, working on a solidarity statement of Black activists, artists, scholars, and students in support of Palestine um, in the, the wake of um, the 2014 war in Gaza and the uprising in Ferguson. Um, and I had a video to show you, but I need to restart my computer to get the audio settings to work. Um, but um, I'll try to put a link to this. Um, in addition to just uh, political writing, um, I was also involved in working with other Black and Palestinian artists, uh, Remy Kanazi, Noura Arakat, and uh, Mari Morales Williams, um, in drafting the script for a solidarity video about the Black and Palestinian struggles called When I See Them, I See Us. Um, and um, the, the point of this video was both to show um, similarities and the forms of state violence and oppression that we experience but also to say that we are more than the oppression that we face, um, that we are not just victims, um, and that we are people people and peoples that are full of life um, and, and worthy of, of life with dignity and with justice. 
Um, and so as a result of um, this work, I have been invited to speak in a lot of places around the world. But the, the place where I've spent the most time has been in Lebanon, um, particularly with Palestinian refugees who have been in exile for over 70 years. Um, and there is so much rich just art um, and culture and resistance among the camps that I, I'm going to spend um, most of my time sharing with you right now. Um, so just to start, when I um, realized that I would be going to Lebanon, I wanted to offer um, something uh, both tangible that could demonstrate solidarity, but also that would be kind of a lasting piece um, for the, the friends and comrades that I met there to, to have. And so I was living in Detroit at the time, and I, um, as Black for Palestine, worked with an artist from a uh, queer and feminist collective, Arab collective in Detroit called the Z Collective. Um, uh, I gave my friend like the concept, I think I want it to be about solidarity, I want people to see a fist, I want the key of return to be there, I want elders of different like kind of ages. Um, and this is the poster that uh, they came up with. And so um, in my trip to Lebanon, um, and really whenever I travel, um, this is one of the, the main gifts that I like to give people. Um, so just briefly to contextualize like what I'm talking about. Um, so there are two um, either youth run centers or centers for uh, Palestinian youth that I, I spend most of my time with when I'm there. Um, the first is al Matab Center for Youth Activities. Um, and they focus on um, really a wide range of cultural and political and like, I guess, school related education um, for Palestinians and uh, other youth in the Bujal Barajne camp outside of Beirut. Um, the other uh, uh, camp I spent time in is in Badawi and Tripoli in the north of Lebanon um, with the Arab Palestinian Cultural Club. So a very similar name to, um, to PAC. Um, but in, in all the camps, but especially in Badawi, um, just public art and murals are a really big form of both bringing life to the camp, but also of uh, retaining and passing on culture and history and heritage. Um, so these are just a few different um, uh, murals and pieces of graffiti um, from the camp. Um, and the, the other thing that's important to share is that uh, most of this art is driven by, by youth. Um, so either the, the, the kind of public pieces along the walls of the camps, um, this is Muhammad who um, with both painting Al-Aqsa um, as, as well as I, someone may on the chat may be able to tell me what the symbolism of the horse is in the Palestinian context, but there was a symbolism. And so um, he was painting this last time I was there a few years ago. Um, here's another uh, close friend who um, painted a mural for the late martyr Basil Arash. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, I don't have a lot to say here beyond um, really just the importance of commemorating um, those who um, uh, just have, have been martyred, have resisted. Um, and particularly um, uh, Basil's importance as somebody who's both an intellectual, um, someone who uh, organized across the diaspora. He's from the West Bank, but was able to visit Lebanon and, and Palestinians and other places, um, and really had the balance of both a, a thinker and someone who contributed to um, the resistance of, of uh, his, his nation and his people. Um, so yeah, we're still in Badawi camp. And um, this was for around Nekba day, I guess four years ago at this point. Um, but the, uh, the Nadi, the uh, Arab Palestinian Cultural Club um, just had a big kind of gathering in uh, the center of the camp for youth to do things like Debka or different um, kind of historical skits to teach about the history of uh, uh, the Palestinian struggle. Um, and so youth are like very present, um, um, both as artists and um, just using art to pass along culture. Um, oh, that, yeah, okay. So this next picture is not in um, one of the camps, it's in Beirut, but this is um, <clears throat> the cast of a, a play that I saw 
um, that adopted uh, Kafka's metamorphosis. So the story of a man who wakes up and discovers that he's turned into a cockroach. Um, and um, what was so just special about this play is that the cast, they're all, uh, they're Palestinian, they're Syrian, they're uh, like African Lebanese or African immigrants from other places on the continent. Um, and through like the traditional play, <clears throat> excuse me, they also, if everyone in the cast had their own kind of monologue where they were able to narrate their own experiences of what it was like to come to Lebanon from somewhere else or from some other uh, struggle or place um, and to kind of be viewed as a cockroach or as an other in larger society. Um, and so the, the play wound up being around like um, just unifying across differences and um, using art to say that we too are, are humans, even if we're refugees, even if we're black or immigrants, um, and that we are also part of this society. And it was just a really kind of moving and beautiful play. Um, so I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about the impact of art across borders and struggles. Um, <clears throat> and what I wanna start with is, let's see. Um, so I don't know how many of you have heard of the um, uh, graphic novel Badawi uh, by Leila Abdurazak, um, but she's a Palestinian artist and uh, wrote a uh, or illustrated a book about her father's experience growing up in Badawi camp um, and also through the the war. Um, and so even here you can see the patris, uh, she says, Palestine is buried deep in the creases of my grandmother's palms. Um, and so when I get to Badawi camp, I ask some of like the, my friends, they're like, have you heard of this book? And my friend Ahmed's like, oh my God, you know, Layla, like I, I've seen this book, I read this book. And so I, I brought the book as a gift, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, um, but they were already aware of it. And so this was an example of across diaspora from uh, uh, Chicago all the way to Badawi camp, um, just the unification of, of Palestinians, even in a very kind of fragmented context. Um, Leila has also been very active in organizing around uh, Palestinian and Arab support for the Black struggle. And um, one of those was designing a shirt, uh, Palestinians for Black Power. So last time I went, this was one of the uh, gifts that I offered folks um, and yeah, I mean, posters and t-shirts, we, we might not think of them as, as art or even as like forms of resistance, um, but because they carry messages that are public, especially if they're messages that like have an impact on people, um, um, it, it really is a way of, of, of kind of slowly, but in a deep way, um, building cultures of solidarity and, and resistance. Um, so I want to um, talk about these two brothers in particular, Abdullah and Muhammad, um, who are both artists um, in the camp and use art both to um, represent Palestine, but also just to represent them themselves and what they're going through. Um, so uh, I forget how many years ago the picture on the, the right was, but this is when I first met them. And um, my time in the camp, especially for the youth, um, was some of the first times they were interacting with like black people from the US, learning about the black struggle. Um, and we're all just immediately very moved by it. Um, and so um, because I see similarities between not just the black struggle in the US, excuse me, but also the South African context and just general African struggles against colonialism, um, I shared a little bit with them about South Africa. And within the next day, Abdullah, the brother on the left here, showed me this drawing that he made um, of, uh, this is uh, a South African chant, Amandla, away to, which means power to the people. Um, and so just very quickly, he understood and like, saw a resonance with um, um, the South African kind of context and struggle. And this is what he illustrated. Um, Shortly after this, I asked each of the brothers if you could illustrate um, what it looks like for Black or African people and Palestinians um, to unite with each other, what would you draw? Um, this is what Abdullah drew. Um, cracks in the wall, you see some tatris and just uh, dresses here. Um, he's also a huge Beyonce fan, so yes, that is Beyonce. 
Um, and then this is what his brother Muhammad drew, um, really just signifying just this really beautiful solidarity and um, connection. Um, and just in general, um, I, I saw so many examples of how our cultures and histories of resistance uh, move across borders. Um, this picture in the back is of comrade George Jackson, um, who it was one of the foremost black revolutionaries and intellectuals um, of the kind of Black Panther, Black Power era. Um, uh, someone had visited uh, the, the equivalent, the PCC, um, in uh, Beirut and left this picture um, of George Jackson, who I was very surprised to see. Um, but less surprising was like examples of just art and resistance and Hassan Kanafani, um, Che, and just other using art again to represent the, the, the figures of um, resistance and, and, and political liberation around the world. Um, um, yeah, and so um, he, again, this poster, so I'll start with the picture on the, the right. Um, this is the guy I get my SIM card from every time I go to Lebanon, like inside his, his cell phone shop by Hamada Street. Um, I gave this poster to him in like 2016. And my last time there in 2019, I walked into the shop and he didn't recognize my face. I said, you don't remember me? And I pointed to the poster and he was like, oh my God, it's you. Like, like I, yeah, and like here it is, like it's been here this whole time. And um, um, really just appreciating um, kind of the, the gesture and the symbolism of solidarity. Um, and this picture on the left is um, just of the, the parents of um, one of my friends in Lebanon who are Palestinian, who lived through just multiple generations of war and resistance and revolution. Um, neither of whom spoke very much English, so we, and my, my Arabi is not that great, so um, we weren't always able to fully communicate, um, but we did play a lot of cards, uh, hand is what um, uh, she taught me, and um, these posters also, they, they understood kind of um, the message behind them, and um, so I, I close or move towards closing in a moment, um, but um, just, yeah, I want to share that um, the, the reason that I view art as just such an important part of our society and our political um, movements and struggles for freedom is because I think more than anything, art has the power to, um, to touch people in a very deep way in their hearts, um, to shift how they think, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, really to bring people together across uh, borders, across languages, across cultures, um, uh, because it, it's just kind of, art has always been a, a, a root of the human experience. It's, it's one of the, the joys and privileges of um, being alive. And so um, I mentioned that I used to do a lot more journalism uh, related work um, but over the pandemic have started to return to some of my roots in more creative writing. Um, it's actually what I love to do. It's what I want to do kind of um, lifelong um, uh, because the, the, the political stuff is very important, um, but there's times when like if you're just directly and expressly political, like some people might get turned off where it doesn't like reach people in the same kind of way. Um, and so um, in the last fall, I, I applied for MFAs in creative nonfiction um, because I want to start bringing in all of my experiences with different movements around the world and to represent that in a more artistic way um, that can reach uh, just wider groups of people. And so um, I'm just going to close um, by reading one kind of excerpt um, from a, a longer piece about um, just I don't know how to describe it, but basically um, just trying to weave together different kind of struggles for, for freedom and helping people understand that. <clears throat> it was the Palestinian struggle that ripped my mind out of the fog of the American nightmare and placed a flame for justice in my heart. And now some of the people I care most about in this world, whom my thoughts turn to first upon waking up and beat last before going to sleep, are Palestinians in Lebanon living under increasingly dire conditions and uncertain futures, with parents and grandparents who survived ethnic cleansing, 
unable to return to their villages an hour or two away simply because they're not part of God's chosen people. I wanted freedom and justice for them over my own. Because in a world where so many of us struggle to say what liberation looks like, the Palestinians can see it. It is returning to their land and their homes. I think of my younger brother, my younger big brother in the camp, Karim, at once a jokester, a jock, and an artist with a sensitive heart, and his five-year-old sister who sent me into uncontrollable sobs at the end of my last trip when she ran into the street with her gap to a smile singing, bye Christian. And I realized that she'd still be stuck in the camp whenever I finally returned. I think of Jenna and her mom, whose loving home cooked lunch sent me running to the bathroom to hide yet another set of ugly tears when I realized three generations of women had to make their meals in a modest corner of the camp after the matriarch survived and fled the massacre in Tantura as a child. And then there's Akram, a man with one of the gentlest spirits I've encountered. The circles under his eyes grow deeper with each subsequent visit, ever more stressed by the already fragile and barren economy shattering around him. And I think of Dina, who hadn't seen her son for a decade after he fled to Europe, seeking asylum from a crowded camp and stagnant life. I wouldn't even wish on those who displaced his people. Um, yeah, so that it goes on a little bit more, but um, just to say that I will be continuing my kind of journey as an artist, um, moving to the New York area at the end of the year for an MFA uh, from NYU. So, um, and this is one of the pieces I submitted for that program. Um, so I'm really excited just to bring a lot more of, of uh, Palestine and freedom struggles into my art. And thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Christian, and congratulations. Uh, I think the PAC community would love to have you closer to us. We're over in New Jersey. Um, I, I'm so grateful you were able to share with us an uh, excerpt of your creative work. Um, and my favorite part from your presentation was the, um, the picture of the pencils versus bullets, because I think that speaks for all art forms that we talked about today, that we can really use that all as a tool to be more to show more and resist in the face of the oppression that we face. Um, thank you so much, Wafat and Christian. Uh, I think we're going to kick off the question and answers. Um, first, I do have a question for Christian. Um, basically, after everything we talked about, if there was one thing you hope that everyone in the audience today would do as a result of our conversation, what would that be? Um, it's less doing and more of a way of being, but um, I hope everyone understands that like we all are artists and we all have stories and there are just many, many different ways to tell those. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it, it's some, you don't need to be a writer, you don't need to be a painter, you don't, you might know how to like uh, embroider, but um, uh, um, if we just think about like the stories that we see in our communities, the stories that we hear our parents or our grandparents tell us, um, the, the stories that we hold in our hearts of just the, what we yearn for and, and might not express to the world, um, we, we all have stories. And so um, just encouraging folks in whatever ways or capacities you're able to, to just be more intentional about noticing the stories around you and thinking like, um, like how might I want to express these or share them with the, the world? Um, yeah, because the, the more that we, we get our stories out into the world, um, uh, I think it's the easier it makes it for other people to understand us and, and to build solidarity with us. I love that. I love that, particularly the piece that we're all artists. We just need to find our outlets. Um, I have a question for Wafat from the chat. Um, many say that Tatriz is a dying art form, unfortunately. How do you recommend keeping, keeping it alive? especially in the diaspora. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's funny because actually what I tend to hear is that it's, I'm making, you know, people are making it too trendy by like putting it online. But um, yeah, I agree, it is endangered. And um, I guess I think the main thing that I try to encourage students like that take my classes is to find their personal connection. They're not, they don't have to embroider a thole. They don't have to embroider at all. But what is their personal connection to this art form and how can they be good patrons to those of us that are doing the preservation work because, you know, 
this isn't a hobby. Um, this is a profession, actually. There's entire professions around art history, around uh, preservation of textiles, like the actual science of how do you preserve silk for 200 years, right? So who are those players in, in that are working towards this? Because it, it can't just be women who are doing this as a hobby or as something extra because they're doing, you know, like a lot of people in our, in the field of Palestinian embroidery, there's only a few of us, but many of them have professions and they're doing this on the side, but I'm really fighting for this to be a profession, like a place where not only those of us who have privilege, economic privilege can do this. And so how do you patron, become a good patron to those people that are doing that work, like Dara Center, like, um, you know, Palestine Heritage Foundation, like Textile Research Center and Leiden University, um, like Dr. Diz and T, you know, who are those people and how do you, you know, do that? And then in terms of knowledge, like it's out there, like I'm teaching classes every day. I mean, to the point I need a break. There are ways to, you know, study you know, just become a good student to this art form. That's ultimately the best way to preserve it is to accept that we're all students to this art form and that continuing to learn about it is sometimes all that you need to do. That's amazing. Yeah, there's there are classes offered at PAC as well for anyone who doesn't know. Um, well, if I, I have another question for you, it's a personal question. What could you share with us what your favorite Tatri's design or story is? Oh, that's so hard. Um, I guess my favorite um, like symbolism is in, uh, there, it's really impossible, but one of my favorites is one that I actually have a chapter on in my book. It's called the Cleopatra design. And the reason I love it, basically it, it's for anyone who hasn't seen it, it basically is a, a, a panel that has like a high heel and it has a mask like with jewel, like bejeweled mask and it has her crown and it has this ring that she had poison in when she drank, you know, before she got captured. Um, and I love the story of Cleopatra being in our embroidery because it brings us back into like this ancient origination of, of you know, this history. But then at the same time, um, you know, Cleopatra, you know, like she, she ruled like she, she's not, she's not Palestinian. So it's just kind of amazing that, um, there was such an appreciation by Palestinians for Cleopatra that, that she would make her way into our art, um, and into our embroidery. Um, but then I also, I, you know, I shared the first Intifada. I think the dresses that came out of the first Intifada are amazing. Cause we also have in their rock throwers, which is one of my favorite pattern to stitch with the, you know, Mansley and, you know, and he's got a kofiya on it. So it's just like, that's the ultimate power right there. Um, so I, I definitely, those are my top two, I'd say. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and I do have a question for both of our panelists, Christian and Wafat. Um, what advice do you have for people who are just starting to find their voice and develop their talents as resistance artists? Oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> um, I guess if you don't mind me going first. Uh, okay. Um, I guess the main thing that I want to say to those people is that like you aren't alone when you're trying to find your voice, like as an artist, or you're kind of exploring these different mediums, sometimes it feels very isolating and lonely. And it's okay to be alone in that journey because it's so personal, but just know you aren't alone, that it's okay to feel lonely, but you're not alone. And that there's a lot of us out here who've been on that same journey and that we still continue on that journey. And um, it's almost a never ending journey as someone who creates or makes, um, even if you don't identify as an artist, like I don't identify as an artist, um, that, that this is part of who we are and that it takes time, but that just know that other people are also on that same journey um, with you. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, 
I would say, I'm especially as a writer, like sometimes I'm like, uh, I like I just can't start writing because just I don't have the right words yet or I'm not sure what the ideas are or like this is going to be terrible. Um, and really that's like the opposite. Just You shouldn't think about any type of art in that way. Like the first draft is always going to be like, it's not going to, it might not be your final kind of product, um, but it will help you figure out like what works and what doesn't or what you want to change or where you need support and like developing something. Um, so really just encouraging you to just, get out whatever it is you need to get out and especially for like the when you're starting out or for the first draft of something it might even be helpful to think of this as okay I'm not sharing this with anybody but just for me and myself like what needs to get on the page or what needs to get out in the world um, and once you give yourself permission to share that at least with yourself you can then kind of figure out okay so what do I want to give to my broader communities or to to the world um but also drawing on what Wafat said, um, community is really important. I am only just getting to a point where um, like my friends who are also artists are starting to either like sit together every now and then and just do work at the same time. Um, or I have a Palestinian friend in London who is also a writer and just wanted an accountability buddy. And so over the last month, we've just said, okay, like, so we'll send each other whatever we have doesn't matter if it's like not well written or scattered but just we need to get it out and we need some feedback um and we've only had one meeting but it's been like so inspiring just to have someone else who is struggling with similar issues or themes and like can give you feedback and help you kind of flesh things out so just encouraging folks to like build community with um other artists That's all really wonderful advice. Thank you um, for reminding us, I guess, about how it can be isolating, but we're not alone. And to Christian's point, how important it is to find our community uh, as emerging artists. Thank you, Wafat, you sharing a link for an upcoming class. Definitely check that out. Um, do we have any more questions? Abby, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I have a question. I'm sorry, it's like kind of too long and I'm still trying to figure it out to put it in the chat, but it's a question that, and like Rania and I have been talking about this a lot and, and I wanted to just hear your thoughts on it. But um, a lot of times like in very like revolutionary spaces or like social justice liberatory spaces, especially when talking about Palestine, a lot of the resistance is seen as like, like the, the quote important resistance, right? Is like the frontline resistance, the, you know, the protests and, and then like, our healing conversations are often on the side. Like they're not seen as like, they're not important, but they're also not very integrated throughout like the whole process. It's just something like, oh, if you need a break, you can do that. And, and I've been in certain spaces where a lot of the people who usually do that work are like, no, we're tired of just being your like, when we need a break, we go there. And that it actually should be integrated throughout the whole process and like the road of revolution and, and liberation so I was just kind of wondering your thoughts of like how do we yeah what are I guess if if you have any thoughts or like ways to mitigate that and ways to make it not just something that's on the side but something that's integrated throughout all of our conversations yeah I mean I guess I think the premise that art is healing is true, but also um, what, I, you know, I think going back to education, like how do you fight, for instance, the appropriation of arts and culture? Like, what is the way that you do that? Think about it, education. And how, how and, and so arts activism is also arts education activism, where they're, you're developing like a visual literacy, even media literacy amongst people so that they can identify what is actually appropriation and what's not. And fighting cultural appropriation, appropriation of art as well is, um, is part of this resistance, right? So I guess it is a form of healing, but then I think part of it is a perspective of like, you know, how do you strengthen your activism? Well, well, I mean, definitely threading a, a needle alone isn't going to do the job, but the education that comes with threading that needle or without, I do lectures and, you know, all that, like even just the origination story of the kofiya as a national symbol, you know, of resistance and like why it's so, 
um, you know, why it's so offensive when we see people wearing it out, you know, outside of the, the it, divorcing it from its original context. Uh, so I think education is a big part of it. And that's why I think arts education has to be part of the discussion around arts and arts as a resistance. Um, trying to formulate my answer here, but mm -hmm. I, 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 I think mo a lot of, I don't want to overgeneralize, but in general, I think a lot of social movements kind of put art on one side and like politics on another, or even like your question about healing, like we don't have time to talk about like healing because like we're in the middle of a struggle, but they, they all actually kind of influence and help each other. Um, and I think of examples of like protests where like sometimes if all you're doing is just like marching and chanting, it can get a little bit kind of dull. Um, but sometimes somebody comes in with like a set of drums. Like I've seen this both at Black Lives Matter protests and Palestine protests. Um, but like when you get a little bit of music to it, it kind of like adds just a energy to the, the space that both then amplifies kind of the, the sense of unity with the political struggle with people around you. Um, and that's just one example of like where it's very kind of easy to blend art and politics. Um, but another example, um, so I spent some time in South Africa and um, there's a very, very, very rich history of just like revolutionary songs and singing um, and um, uh, singing as a way to kind of lift the spirits in order to get ready for uh, a protest or for some other form of, of resistance. Um, and it's something that like, I don't know how to describe it. It's just you're in a room with like 50 people and like someone just starts to tune and then like two other people pick it up and then suddenly the whole room is like in harmony and they know all the words and like they're dancing and like people are just getting really into it. And um, um, yeah, it's just, it, it, it's a very kind of critical um, uh, way of just rejuvenating the, the spirit in order to um, uh, have the endurance for the long-term political work. Yeah, and I guess to add to that too is, you know, because, you know, when you're talking about music, it is a different kind of thing because it, it gives you voice, it gives you a voice. And, and then when you're all singing together, it's a collective voice you're hearing, not you hear your own. And when you listen close, you hear individuals, but when you listen all together, you hear everyone. And there's something really powerful about that in the, in the literal sense of elevating your voice and amplifying your voice. Well, how do you amplify your voice? You amplify it with other people. That's how the voice gets amplified. So it is very powerful when you start looking at um, giving voice. And, and I think too, different art forms give voice to different parts of our activism as well that might not always be accessible in a moment, in, in, a, in an event or something like that, you know? Yeah, I think PAC offers some sort of um, like arts classes, and we have a question from PAC uh, community member asking, what advice would you give for PAC and other communities uh, and community centers to foster and amplify art? Sorry, can you repeat the last part? Advice to who? Oh, uh, advice for PAC and other communities to foster and amplify art. I feel like I always go first, so I'm gonna let you go first. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know that I have an answer though. Um, I mean, I, you're already like doing part of it and, and hosting this discussion. Um, I think the other piece is just uh, intentionally and regularly bringing um, like art into your programming and like inviting artists to speak or give workshops or. Um, <laughs> I was trying to find an example of one of these South African songs. Just, it, um, but yeah, I, I just, I, I'm sorry, I'm going <laughs> to. I totally agree with you, though, about programming. I guess one thing I do want to kind of mention as an additional thing, because I definitely think programming, elevating voices, all of these kinds of things that you're already doing, 
Being a creator online is very challenging. You post your work and it's frequently copied or it's removed from you and shared without your permission. And I think creating more um, awareness about how difficult it is as a creator sharing your work online, the only way, like I don't do it anymore, specifically because I, it's not just, it's not respected as mine. It then is taken over by the algorithm, it's taken over by the community and propagated. And a lot of time propagated to the point that it doesn't even have a context or a story or a connection back to me anymore. And so I think this idea, like I, I know I always go back to education, but this awareness around um, how, how do we wanna cultivate artists? How do we wanna cultivate creators and makers and encourage them to share and, and to create community spaces where we can all share and appreciate and admire that. Well, part of that comes with respecting the creation and respecting the creator. And, and I think that in our community, in the Palestinian community, art is often viewed as something extra. Um, there isn't this sort of view that art, you know, art isn't viewed as, you know, a profession. It's not viewed as, there's, there's just a cultural way we look at art as um, something that anyone can do. And I think that this is problematic in general because what it does is it causes us to want to haggle and pay less for art. It causes us to haggle and pay less for embroidery when it's actually hard labor. It causes us to um, take pictures and recreate other people's you know, projects um, that they spent years on and commission it and get it done and just so they can have it in their house without respect to the creator. Um, printing things off of, offline from like a photographer, Palestinian photographer who's sharing their work, but it's actually their copyright. So having more, uh, res I think in our community, we could do more to educate others about how to show respect for creators, makers, artists so that we can encourage that sharing more and more and that um and that creates a safe space i think for creators to then um do more and share more um i feel very strongly about that actually yeah thank you so much for sharing that and i want to thank again wafa and christian for being with us today being with us here today and thank you for everyone who tuned in for your attention during this session. Uh, and I also wanna thank the Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace or PCAP for being a sponsor for our conference today. Uh, PCAP works to educate Christian churches, organizations and individuals about what's happening in Palestine and encourages and supports their advocacy for Palestinian rights in the US and beyond. They represent a Palestinian Christian voice in US Christian circles they also work to theologically counter Christian Zionism. They are actively recruiting new Palestinian, Arab, and other allied volunteers and committee members. Please consider supporting their work and joining them. And then we also have um, a fun trivia thing that we've added like throughout the conference. Um, so uh, what not, we're gonna put a link in the chat right now. Um, there's, if you want to win one of our awesome shirts and speaking of artists and giving credit to artists, we have an amazing graphic designer. She's actually on the right of the photo, Fadiel Eva, who created all of our graphics, our booklet and um, used designs to make shirts that say until freedom or like the conference theme. So if you want a chance to win a free one, um, answer the question, the trivial question, um, the link is in the chat. And then um, if you're the first to answer it correctly, we'll send you a shirt. If you just want to support, pack and buy one of the shirts, if you really enjoyed the conference, it's also available on our bonfire website, which we can also put the link to. Um, and again, I just want to echo um, what Jinan said. I really want to thank Wafa and Christian for spending, you know, your Sunday afternoon or morning, whatever time zone you're in with us. And um, this was actually one of my favorite sessions. So thank you for, for inspiring us and, and, you know, for all the work that you do. And I really want to thank Jinan for doing an awesome job moderating and very much part of a PAC family. So we really appreciate you, Jinan. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, don't go anywhere. We're giving, we have a little break and then we're going to have our closing session of the conference where we're going to kind of talk about 
what freedom can look like in the future, what we can do with all the information that we learned um, in the last four days, um, and, and hopefully come up with a collective vision together. So we'll see you all back at 1230. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.